I'm fired up despite that hideous crap fest that I was subjected to last night. Because I see the bigger picture. I see NFL Week 3. However, if we're going with recency bias and the last thing I saw, it was that hideous crap fest last night. You know, the proverbial, if I wasn't getting paid to talk about this crap, I would never be watching this crap. Only worse. It was worse than that. Like calling Broncos Niners color rush bad is an insult to color rush games. That game last night was an insult to the sport. That la- that game last night was even a rough one for all you Trey haters. You know, the Trey area. Frisco, I hate to pile on by calling you Frisco because I know you're already in a bad way, Frisco. So I'll just call you the Trey area instead, Frisco. The Trey area, Frisco, spent the entire offseason debating between Lance and Jimmy G. Turns out that may have been a big waste of time. Not because Trey got hurt, but despite getting them to the Super Bowl, I'm not sure G is any more prepared for the big stage at this point than Lance was or wasn't. I mean, at least Trey Lance never pulled an Orlovsky. I'm talking about not the sneeze fart. I, I never thought that I'd reach a point in my career where I would say the word fart on the radio, even. Even. Not even when I was in college radio did I do that. Yet here I am as a middle-aged dude on an internationally syndicated program, and it keeps coming up over and over and over again. Now, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking, however, about the football equivalent of the sneeze fart. Jimmy G actually made stepping out of the back of the end zone look even worse than Orlovsky ever could because Jimmy didn't just pull an Orlovsky. He combined it with a Wentz. He took a safety and he threw a pathetic jump ball for a pick six on the same play, a.k.a. one of the worst quarterback plays you will ever, ever, ever see. I mean, what a devastating play. You know, Orlovsky and Wentz were both like, yes, yes, yes. Orlovsky might be off the hook, but Wentz is not. And then you lose Trent Williams, too. Like, I would say, luckily for the Niners, that only counted as two points for Denver, except those two points decided the game, which ended with a perfectly appropriate 11-10 to score. An absolutely hideous final score for an absolutely hideous football game. Somehow, someway, by divine intervention and a miracle, Coach Ritt and Russ are actually 2-1. and one. Let's ride. And they couldn't look. Let's ride. Broncos country, let's hide. Broncos country, let's ride. And my man, he was fired up, wasn't he, after the game? And he did tag his post-game interview on the field with, let's ride. Broncos country, let's, let's ride. hide. Coach Ritt and Russ, somehow, somewhere, 2-1. and one, And they could not look much worse. I mean, you are what your record says you are, except in their case. But they are currently tied with the Chiefs for first place in the allegedly toughest division in football. I think now would be a pretty good time for all of us, myself included, to stop saying that about the AFC West because that's obviously not what that is. And I'm not being harsh at all when I say that they could not look any worse. I'm actually being generous. These dudes three and outed nine times. Let me repeat that. They won a game in which they three and outed Three plays and off the field nine different times. Nine times. Russell nine Wilson times. looked nine like he was out times. there cooking with NyQuil. You see what I did there? We had that take Broncos last country. week where there That's are a bunch right. of bum asses cooking food in NyQuil. Coach Ritt looked like the actual Ritt. Game on. Which tells you all you need to know. Yet they're 2-1. and one. Now, they might be the worst 2-1 team I've ever seen, but they're 2-1. and one. Then you got the Buffalo Bills. Transition. The Buffalo Bills might be the best 2-1 team I've ever seen, but what does that mean, especially given how banged up they are? That said, I'm not taking anything, anything at all, away from those legends in South Florida. So why don't we move on to that game? Because that was a real football game between two real football teams. 
The only thing that Sunday Night Football and the Bills Dolphin had in common was a hilarious safety, a.k.a. the butt punt. Truly one of the more bizarre bizarre plays you're ever going to see in that league. Somehow punting the ball straight off a blocker's ass and out of the back of the end zone was actually a decent development for the Dolphins. I have just never seen a butt punt before. Never. And neither has the cheetah himself. Next time he's going to catch it with his butt cheeks because he's got strong butt cheeks. I don't know what I like better. The the cheetah busts out of Kansas City, goes to Miami, completely revamps that team and gives them life. Or the fact that he's allowed to talk now. Where was all this when he was in KC? The Cheetah is absolutely in fuego with his post-game comments this season. He's better after the game than he is during the game, and he's still like the most dangerous guy in the game. And he's third in the league in receiving yards right now, and I would still argue that he's better after after the game than he is during the game. Except the butt punt did not end that game. In fact, he gave Buffalo one more drive and a potential look at a game-winning field goal. Brutal ending. Like, get up, get up, get up, spike the ball. Five, four, three, two, one. Come on! That's what I heard. That's what I saw. All I could think is they were trying to get to the line of scrimmage and they were rushing up, and Josh Allen was trying to get guys set was five, four, three, two, one. Insert James. Come on! That jumped the weekend. There was no way James in Portland's manual buzzer was not going to jump the weekend. What a brutal ending, but not as brutal. And I got to admit, in watching the first couple of weeks, I thought, Ken Dorsey, man, he seems kind of cerebral. He seems kind of calm. He actually seemed pretty calm, you know, kind of nerdy and intellectual. And I I don't know, like, like he was as a player. That was an incredible act, an incredible act. Uh, And don't at me with Rome. He had every right to be pissed. I'm not saying he didn't. I'm just saying it was incredible the way he wrecked that hotel room or coaching box. And Motley Crue back in the day couldn't do that kind of damage. And speaking of TV 45, his big meeting of the goats was completely upstaged by the Finns and the Bills and pretty much everything else that happened yesterday because, let's admit it, Brady and Rodgers was pretty much a freaking snooze. Last night's 11 to 10 is one of the most revolting final scores ever. Maybe the most revolting final score ever, but 14 to 12 ain't a hell of a lot better. And Bucks Packers was as butt ugly as that score. I mean, for the first 58 minutes of that game, the most throwing thing that happened was TB45 scrambling and ambling for a first down and somehow not disintegrating into dust right there on the field, right before our eyes. This dude went from goat and a Dadonis He looks like a Dadonis. To a poor man's Kevin Bacon and the leader of an offense with absolutely no juice whatsoever. Now, I'm not saying that it's all his fault because it's not. He was missing a lot of his weapons. But the case in point, that horrifying zombie scramble is what counts for thrilling offense in Tampa these days. I turned to my son, Rogan Loam, and said, hey, pretty funny, Junior. Pretty funny, Junior, putting the game on in slow-mo for me. I didn't even know we could do that on our smart TV. You know, I'm old and all. I didn't know you can do stuff like that. I'm barely smart enough to figure out how to do that on my smartphone. Hey, but do me a favor. Rogan Loam, stop jerking with the controls. I'm trying to get some work done here. To which he said was, I didn't do anything, Pop. I didn't do anything. I mean, damn. Kevin Bacon is all up in here. TB45 is all up in here speed walking like it was the combine all over again when he ran that eight flat in the 40. But... Give the dude this. Give Bacon this. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon. He did what he had to do, well, to his face and to that offense. And then finally on the last drive of the game, old man Brady got his creaky old bones all the way down the field. 
to finally score the first and only tap a TD with 14 seconds left in the game, and now we're in business. And everybody who had Green Bay plus one and a half had to be a little bit concerned. And he spent so much energy doing so, though, he immediately had a senior moment on the two-point conversion when he had a chance to tie that game. Even though James in Portland was on Twitter trying to drag the big head and eye into his love for OU, and that didn't work, I guarantee he was watching Tom Brady getting them lined up for a two-point conversion only to see them get flagged for delay of game and then thought to himself, that'd be a good place for a James in Portland manual buzzer. Come on! (laughs) Brady has played like 100 years and still does not realize that it's easier to get two yards than it is seven. Kind of blows my mind. How can the greatest quarterback ever take a delay of game at home on a two-point conversion to tie? A lot of belief going on, dude. I get it. And you look like it. Not a great day for TB45. Not a great day for Ken Dorsey. Not a great day for Jimmy G. Not a great day for anybody who stayed up to watch Sunday Night Football last night. But nobody had a worse week three than the former QB of the Eagles and the Colts because the Carson Wentz, quote, revenge game turned into the latest Carson Wentz catastrophe game and another Jalen Hurts coronation. Like, Frisco might be a little bit confused this morning about who they actually want quarterbacking their team. Not that they have a choice. But there is absolutely no mystery in Philly this morning because, holy crap, Jalen Hurts is still balling the hell out and getting better by the week. And as far as Wentz goes, he had an opportunity to make an ex jealous and instead showed that ex that dumping his ass was the best decision that ex ever made. Wentz was horrible. I mean, he was horrendous, but don't take my word for it. Take it from the guy himself. Dude, did you start that off by saying that you were not good enough? Saying that you're not good enough is not good enough. Definitely not good enough. I mean, what you then went on to say was, we have to do this better. I have to start better. I have to start faster. So we're not playing catch up the entire second half. You mean, essentially, you have to stop being you. He didn't play to his standard. That's pretty alarming because that standard is pretty terrible. But he's right. He was even worse than he normally is. This dude got sacked nine times. Nine times. He averaged 2.9 nine yards times. per pass. Nine he fumbled times. twice. He lost it once. I mean, like, you never really know what you're going to get with Carson Wentz other than when he's good, he's all right. And when he's bad, he's horrible. But he was so much worse than that in a game that you know he wanted worse than the Super Bowl. Meanwhile, Jalen Hurts was so good that his MVP odds are still going up. He was plus 800 a week ago, which was a revelation into itself. And now he sits at plus 700. Dude is the breakout star of the season so far, and Carson Wentz is still just Carson Wentz. So, Philly fan has got to be feeling amazing this morning. Wait, there's more. Nobody is having a better Monday, I saved the best for last, than the Dolphins and Dolphin fan. Because the biggest story in the NFL right now is still the Finns and their cojones.